Hey, how's it going? Lee Hayward here with the Total Fitness Bodybuilding video chat. And uh, today, for the next hour or so, I'm going to be hanging out here and answering any questions that you may have. So if there's any specific topics of discussion, be it building muscle, losing fat, uh, any specific challenges that you're dealing with when it comes to your workouts uh, or your nutrition program, anything like that, Feel free to post those questions and topics of discussion in the comment section, and I'll do my best to help you out in any way that I can. So I'm just going to uh, double check now to make sure that this is live and coming through loud and clear and all that good stuff, because I've, I've had some issues in the past with uh, getting these YouTube live streams to work. So I just want to make sure that it's coming through loud and clear. And for those of you who are tuned in watching this live right now, if you could be so kind as to let me know if you can hear me and see me and all that kind of stuff, I would really appreciate it. So just bear with me for a moment while I uh, get this set up here. Just make sure it's coming through clear. All right, let's see. It says live now. Just make sure that the questions and comments are coming through. Hmm. Give me a second. Now I can't see the, the the questions and comments here. All right, let me just open this up. All right, I think it's coming through now. Let me just see. All right, so good. All's good. All right, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. All right. Now I had some questions. Um, come through earlier from uh, some of my followers on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Inner Circle. And I just wanted to cover this because it's a pretty important topic. Um, a lot of people that I've uh, been talking to recently when it comes to training and nutrition and stuff like that, they've, they're in the, the phase of you know, working out on and off again. And I, I've mentioned this several times in previous videos. But when it comes to resuming a workout program, even if you've been, you know, you, you've worked out on and off in the past, regardless of how experienced you've become over the years, if you've had a prolonged layoff from training and you're getting back into it again, the bottom line is you need to start training like a beginner if you're coming back to the gym after a layoff. And, and when I say a layoff, I'm talking about something that is a fairly lengthy layoff. I mean, if you only take a week or two off training, that's that's only a short break. I mean, you can basically just resume your workouts from where you left off. But if you haven't been to the gym in you know a few months or more, then you need to resume back as a beginner. And I, I've on my main YouTube channel, I've got some videos there covering workout suggestions for beginners, and that's a great place to start. In fact, right on the main channel page, I think there's a link to a, a beginner's workout playlist that I have there. And what I generally recommend for most people is to start off with a basic total body beginner's workout, you know, three days a week, just go in there, folks, on hitting your entire body with basic machine exercises. And this is a great way to get yourself back into the, I guess, the whole routine of working out again to condition your muscles and to help, you know, build up your work capacity and your fitness level. Now, as far as your nutrition is concerned, um, I mean, that's obviously going to depend whether your goal is to gain size or whether your goal is to lose body fat. But keep it simple. A lot of people overcomplicate things, and this applies to their training, applies to their diet. They overcomplicate it. I mean, if you're not doing anything at this stage, and then any form of diet and exercise routine that you follow consistently is going to produce results. So it doesn't have to be you know, a strict regimented program. It doesn't have to be, you know, a super uh, structured diet plan. I mean, even making better food choices and being consistent with your meals will move you in the right direction. And that's what a lot of people need to focus on at the start is just moving themselves in the right direction. Don't worry about being perfect. Just worry about making progress. And the cool thing is, is you can always make adjustments as you go. I mean, there's no perfect diet and exercise program. You're always going to be uh, following some sort of, of plan and then mod monitoring your results and adjusting your program based on how your body responds to it. 
So a lot of people try and think that, oh, I have to have the perfect workout program, I have to have the perfect diet, and I have to have everything, all, all my you know, ducks in a row before I even get started. And that's kind of the wrong way to go about it. Just jump in. Who cares if it's perfect? I mean, even if you're following a half-assed workout, a half-assed diet, it doesn't matter. Just get in there and start doing something. And then as you get the momentum built up and as you just get into the gym and training, as you get into the habit of eating more consistently, then you can worry about and making improvements as you go. But don't think about trying to have everything perfect before you get started because it's never going to be perfect. You're always going to have to be making adjustments on the fly. And the thing is, is just making those the, the habit of training, the habit of eating properly, just kind of ingrain that into a lifestyle. And that's what I think a lot of people get hung up on is, is the paralysis by analysis. They're, they're watching YouTube videos and they're following people on social media and, and there's so many different diet and exercise programs out there and they're just getting confused and bogged down. Keep it simple. Just follow some basic beginner's program, some you know, simple nutrition plan and worry about tweaking it and modifying it as you go. I mean, there's nothing wrong with trying some different uh, strategies if you want to try different nutrition strategies or different workout strategies, but realize that there's no one perfect program. I mean, there's so many different programs out there, and there's pros and cons to all of them, and it really depends on where you are right now in your particular training situation. Uh, another thing, I had another question that came through here, and this one's kind of similar to those along those lines. Um, Stuart was asking, uh, he wanted to know the difference between powerlifting training, bodybuilding training, uh, functional training slash CrossFit. Uh, he says he's hearing a lot of information about this and obviously getting confused of them. And he wanted to know, you know, what's the difference between all these different styles of training? Well, from if you're an actual athlete and, you know, you are a powerlifter getting ready for a powerlifting meet, then obviously you want to fo follow a powerlifting style of training. And there is a big difference between powerlifting and bodybuilding. Uh, obviously, if you're a bodybuilder getting ready for a competition, you know, there's a specific style of training, specific style of eating that you're going to follow for that. Uh, same with any type of athletic training. But a lot of people who are training, or I shouldn't even say the word training, a lot of people who are going to the gym and exercising, uh, you don't need to follow a, a rigid program. It's okay to exercise for the sake of exercise. And what I mean by this is you don't have to follow a structured, you know, a powerlifting split or a bodybuilding split or some sort of athletic, you know, training program. It's okay to go in there and exercise for the sake of exercise, meaning to, you know, move your body just to work on your functional, overall general health and fitness, uh, general cardiovascular training, general strength training, and to have fun with it. It doesn't always have to be a regimented, structured program. And uh, a lot of people, especially beginners, I think, get bogged down in this. You know, again, they're, they're afraid to start a program because they think it has to be, you know, I have to follow this program, these exercises, this nutrition plan. And a lot of times it's just not the case. You know, you can just go in there and exercise for the sake of exercising. And then as you get more advanced, if you want to take it to, you know, a competitive stage where you're going to be competing in a powerlifting meet or a bodybuilding meet, then that's when you can get some specialized coaching to help you in those areas. But again, I, you know, I see too many people bogging themselves down with the details when they should just be focusing on the big picture of getting in better shape. And that can be done with, you know, general strength training, general cardiovascular training, you know, general flexibility training. It doesn't always have to be, you know, something crazy structured and regimented. All right, we got several people joining us live here now, and I'm going to be uh, just jumping in and trying to take a bunch of different questions that came through here. Uh, okay, quick one. This one's from Droid Gunner saying, can I take creatine with my pre-workout? Absolutely. It really doesn't matter when you take creatine. You can take it with a pre-workout. You can take it with a post-workout. You can just take it throughout the day. It really doesn't matter. What matters the most is that you're taking it consistently and that you have a steady supply of creatine in your system. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's it really doesn't matter. Uh, next question here. This one's from Mathea. says, a chiropractor told me to stretch two times a day and give eight different standard routines. And in order to get a more balanced body, how does that affect my gym gains if I train for two hours, five days a week? 
Uh, stretching does not hinder your muscle gains. If anything, it's going to actually help your muscle gains. And what I personally like to do is when I'm following a workout routine, let's just say I, I'm training back, then after my back workout, I'm going to spend some time stretching my back, stretch out the muscles that I just trained. Uh, if I did a leg workout, then after that, I'm going to spend some time stretching out my legs. And that's a good little rule of thumb that anyone can apply, re regardless if you know you have any you know issues that you're dealing with, uh, just to stretch out the body parts that you trained after your workouts. And I always recommend stretching after a workout rather than before, because after your muscles are pumped up, they're warmed, uh, there's blood in there, and it's it's more easy to stretch a warm, pumped muscle than it is to stretch a cold muscle, and your risk of injury is greatly reduced. If you try and stretch a cold muscle, you're more likely to actually pull or tear that muscle rather than stretch it. You know, you can kind of use the analogy of uh, trying to stretch a cold rubber band. I mean, if you took a rubber band and put it in the freezer for several hours and got cold and stiff, and then you immediately stretch that rubber band, it's very likely to actually snap. Whereas if you keep that rubber band uh, warm, uh, you know, in room temperature, or even place it in like a direct sunlight so that it can actually warm up, that rubber band will be much more pliable and flexible and will be more likely to stretch rather than snap. Well, your muscles are kind of the same way. You want to make sure that your muscles are fully warmed up before you do any stretching. So uh, you're, you're recommended to do stretches twice a day. Uh, what I would suggest, one of those stretching routines can be done right after your workouts when your muscles are already warmed up. Uh, but if you want to do another stretching routine another time, then do some sort of warm up before you actually get into your stretching. And that could be as simple as, you know, doing some cardiovascular exercise. I mean, it doesn't have to be anything too elaborate. I mean, it can be just some general calisthenics or cardio, you know, a little, a little jog around the block or something like that, just to warm up your body before you actually get into your stretching routine. And I think you'll be much better off because of it. All right, let's move on. Um, we got... All bets on Ace joining us. He's saying, what's up, Lee? Hey, how you doing? Uh, Mustafa joining us. Uh, the Red Devils, 22, is joining us, saying, hey, Lee, how's it going? Doing great. Um, okay, got a question here. Wait, or actually, it's not really a question. It's, uh, I always give up on diet. Please advise. <laughs> okay, you're always giving up on your diet. Well, if you're having trouble sticking to a diet plan, you really need to kind of zoom out and look at the big picture. I mean, that's a very vague question, but what is it that's causing you to have trouble with that particular diet plan? I mean, if it's a muscle building diet, are you having trouble sticking to the meal frequency? Are you having trouble actually meeting the, the macronutrients? Uh, if it's a fat loss diet, are you having trouble limiting your caloric intake and, and you know, getting yourself into a, a proper fat loss diet plan. So, I mean, you, what I would suggest in these situations is to really kind of zoom out and look at the big pictures and see where are you going wrong. What's the areas that are giving you the most trouble? A uh, couple suggestions that I do have. Uh, for those of you who are following a high calorie mass building diet, I purposely find it uh, easier to follow a diet where you're eating more frequently throughout the day in order to bump up your caloric intake for mass building. And vice versa, if you're following a fat loss diet, it's sometimes easier to eat less frequently throughout the day in order to cut back on your calories. And when you look at it, like sitting down to the table for a meal, most people are going to eat until they're comfortably full at any given meal. You know, that, that's where you're going to default. You're going to eat until your belly is comfortably full, and that's it. You know, I know sometimes you might like splurge and stuff yourself, especially if it's like, a, you know, you're going out to dinner, or you got a big family barbecue, or, you know, Thanksgiving, or something along those lines. But overall, you're just going to eat till you're comfortably full. So use that as your benchmark. That's your comfort zone, eating until you're comfortably full. So if you want to eat a higher calorie diet, then rather than trying to force more calories in per meal, simply eat more meals, and that will help to bump up your overall caloric intake. Vice versa, if you're trying to restrict your calories and eat a low-calorie diet for fat loss, then instead of trying to eat less calories per meal, try eating less meals. 
And this is a very simple strategy, but I've, it works very well. And I mean, if you want to take it like to uh, you know a higher level for low calorie fat loss dieting, a lot of people get into following an intermittent fasting program where they're going you know several hours, the majority of the day, without eating any food whatsoever, allowing their body to tap into burning stored body fat during those fasting hours, and then eating until they're comfortably full in their you know during their meals that their I guess window of opportunity when they can eat throughout the day. And that is a strategy that has worked very well. And I've incorporated various, uh, you know, forms of that myself when following a fat loss cutting diet. And I find that it works really well. So it, it's not always, you know, that you're doing something wrong. Uh, it, it's kind of like you need to uh, look at the bigger picture of what's going on and try and adjust your eating habits to meet the type of diet that you want to follow. So. I know this is kind of a general question because it is, you know, a general answer to a general question. But if this is something that you would like to have some more help with, because I know the, the topic of bodybuilding nutrition can be very deep and complex, then uh, if you want some help with this, I actually do offer, you know, coaching with when it comes to uh, preparing customized diet plans. And if you want information about that, just uh, head on over to my website at leehayward.com. And up in the top menu bar, there is a section there for online coaching. And I'll be more than happy to help you out with that. Uh, we've got, okay, just uh, skimming through. We've got uh, Maher joining us, saying hi. We've got Daniels joining us. Hi, Daniel. Uh, I, I knew this would come up today. Uh, All bets on Ace is asking, you know, what's your thoughts on Rich Piana? Uh, I'm sure a lot of people have seen this on social media, if, if you're on like Facebook or YouTube or wherever you're, I mean, obviously you're on YouTube, but it, it, I've seen it on social media today. Uh, supposedly Rich Piana passed away. Um, again, I'm, I don't know Rich personally. I, I only follow him online like I guess a lot of people do, but it is definitely a, a, a sad situation for sure. I mean, I've, I know he covers a lot of different controversial topics, obviously like performance enhancing drugs and things like that. And you know, hey, if, if that's what you're into, that's totally fine. Uh, I did have a lot of respect for Rich because I liked his videos. I liked the way he was kind of like a no bullshit type of guy, just said it like it is. And it's it's sad. I think it's a big loss. He had a huge following, and you know I did enjoy watching some of his videos. I wasn't a, a huge hardcore fan of him, but you know when I did watch some videos, uh, I generally did enjoy him, and I liked again his his no BS attitude, just like tell it like it is. And again, I, it's it's sad to see that he's passed away. I think he's only 46 years old. So, I mean, that's that's way too young to be leaving this world, in my opinion. But I guess when your time is up, your time is up. And the main thing is to live live life to the fullest while you're here. But uh, again, it is a sad thing for sure. I know uh, just recently we had uh, another top-level bodybuilder. Uh, oh, gee, what's his name? died from choking on his food. Is it Dallas McCarver? I can't remember his last name now. Dallas uh, is an Olympia competitor. I posted it on Facebook, actually. I've seen it there. Uh, passed away from choking on his food just earlier this week. So, I mean, it's the bodybuilding world is having some top-name guys dropping off this week. It's, a, it's unfortunate, but that's just the way it is. All right, moving on. Let's see what else we got. Uh, a lot of people just tuning in there saying that the audio and the video is coming through. Thank you for that. Okay. All right. Got a question here. Let's see. Um, okay. Jeffrey's posting a question here, actually. Where is it to? I, I think I skipped a bunch of questions. Hang on, guys. I, I, scroll, I scrolled through too fast here, and I missed a few questions. Uh, all right. Uh, what do you say regarding training to failure? Uh, made lots of progress keeping some reps in the tank in my first two sets. Then by the end, I struggled a bit yet I complete the reps. All right, that's a good question. Training to failure. And there's different schools of thought on this. You know, the whole high intensity training, uh, I guess, school of thought, you know, the heavy duty, the, the, you know, Dorian Yates, blood and guts is to push yourself to failure and beyond. And that definitely does work. 
there's no doubt about it. You can make great progress by pushing yourself to failure. And I mean, obviously, by doing so, you are stimulating the body, you're pushing its your limits, and you are forcing yourself to, you know, adapt and grow as in response to the training. You know, provided you give yourself enough time to rest and recover between workouts, then training to failure can be very productive. However, there's it's a double-edged sword. There is a dark side to training to failure, and that is it greatly increases your risk of injury. When you build up to lifting heavy weight and you push yourself to your limit, uh, the risk of actually pulling or tearing something uh, increases dramatically. Uh, when I was younger, I used to do a lot of training to failure. And then, you know, as I got a, a bit older, I, I've suffered some, you know, pretty, sometimes some minor injuries, but I did have a few major ones, you know, like I, I've torn both biceps. Uh, I've had some, you know, various muscle pulls and injuries. I actually tore a muscle in my lat tricep tie-in area right under the armpit area. Uh, so once you've had a few you know, serious injuries like that, it kind of gives you a wake-up call to realize, hey, I'm not invincible and I need to respect my body more. So what I recommend to the majority of people now is to avoid training to failure. You can still train in a progressive overload fashion. You can still make progress with your workouts without pushing yourself to the absolute edge without pushing yourself to failure. I mean, it's okay to stop a set, you know, with a rep or two left in the tank and to rack the weight on your own. Uh, that's totally fine. And you can, like I say, you can still train in a progressive overload fashion. You can still make progress with your workouts uh, and do so in a much safer, you know, manner. And that's what I recommend for most people. Because again, training to failure, even though it is productive, uh, the, risk to to, the risk to reward ratio is not in your favor, and that's why I'm uh, kind of against it. And if you look at a lot of uh, strength athletes, like a lot of power lifters, a lot of Olympic lifters, and, and people like that, I mean, obviously, they're training in a progressive overload fashion, but you don't see these guys repping out to failure, or at least not very often. In fact, most of the time, if you ever see a power lifter uh, hit failure, it's usually because they're you know attempting a lift and they miss it. You know, it's not that they're taking a weight and they're repping it out to failure like you see a lot of bodybuilders do. Uh, so I'm not against training heavy. I mean, that, that's totally fine as long as you're lifting within your means. But again, that whole idea of repping out to failure where you get to the point where your body is fatigued, your form starts to, to go to crap. And I mean, it, it, it just gets it, it just escalates and gets worse as you continue on. I mean, if you train heavy and stop short of failure you're still lifting while your form and technique is relatively good. But if you push yourself to that failure mark, then your form is starting to break down. Exhaustion is setting in, you know, not only muscular exhaustion, but cardiovascular exhaustion and, and you become more unstable. And again, it, it just greatly increases your risk of injury when you get to the end of a set and you're pushing that limit. So I'm not a, a big fan of it. And I try and think of safety more than pushing myself to failure. I mean, if, if there's anything that's going to slow your gains, it's getting an injury. So anything that you can do to prevent injury is going to keep your training more consistent and it'll help you making gains longer over the, you know, over the long term. All right, moving on. We got uh, Lily is joining us saying, love your stuff, Lee. Thanks. I appreciate it. Um, all right. Some more people asking about Rich Piana and stuff like that. I, I'm not going to get into that anymore. I mean, obviously I've kind of, you know, shared my two cents worth above um, obviously I'm you know saddened to hear it and you know thoughts and prayers go out to his friends and family and that obviously it's a hard time for them it's sure, for sure but you know people are asking you know do you think drugs and bodybuilding I mean obviously I'm sure that had something to do with it but it, it's not a fine line I mean there, there are a lot of bodybuilders out there who have used steroids and are still living you know I mean you look at a lot of the old-time bodybuilders who have used steroids and admitted to using steroids and have lived long healthy lives you know it, it when it comes to muscle enhancing drugs performance enhancing drugs I, I think there's there's use and abuse uh, just like with any drug, you know. So I mean, I'm not going to say that it was directly re result of that. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not. I don't know him personally or anything like that. So I'm not really going to get into much detail about it. But uh, you know, obviously, it probably did play a role. I, I won't d deny that. And I mean, I think another thing that plays a big role as well is just his sheer size. 
I mean, any time that you are a massive individual, like at 300 plus pounds, I mean, that places a lot of strain on your internal organs, you know, your, your heart, your liver, your, your whole, you know, system. I mean, your body is not meant to be that big, regardless if, if that weight is coming from excess body fat or if it's coming from excess lean muscle tissue, it still places a lot of strain on the body. And I think that that may have had a role to play in it as well. But again, you know, I'm, I'm just speculating like, like, like a lot of people are. I mean, obviously I, I don't know the specific situation, so I'm not going to try and, uh, you know, discuss it or get into much more detail on it. All right, moving on. Another question here. This one's from Griffin and he's asking our fat, from mayonnaise or cooking steaks in oil bad for you? It's It comes down to, I guess, uh, moderation for a lot of that stuff. But uh, generally speaking, fat that you'll find in things like mayonnaise, uh, you know, vegetable oils and stuff like that, they're, they're not the highest quality oil. Uh, so if you are going to, you know, use them, use them in moderation, or try and find healthier alternatives. Uh, yeah, I know a lot, a lot of people like to use uh, uh, coconut oil for cooking. Uh, if, if you're going to use like oil on a salad or something, you probably want to find something like a healthier alternative, such as like an olive oil. Um, you know, no, another thing you want to use is like if you're looking for alternatives to mayonnaise, you might look into things like Greek yogurt or maybe even like uh, mashing up avocado and getting like a creamy uh, texture that you can use there to use in place of a uh, mayonnaise. There are healthier alternatives. A lot of the processed oils and a lot of the processed uh, food spreads, salad dressings, things of that nature, they tend to have the lower quality oils and it's it's i'm not saying that you have to avoid them altogether but obviously they're not going to be conducive to your health and fitness goals so you want to like say minimize and look for healthier alternatives now with that being said i don't believe in avoiding fat entirely you know a lot of people kind of place fat in the category of all fat is bad fat and it's not the case i mean there are some healthy fats out there and your body needs fat you know, like especially the omega-3 fatty acids, which are, are you know, most people are deficient of. Uh, but healthy fat should play a, a good role in your nutrition program. But again, you have to make the proper choices. Uh, things that I like to uh, look for when I'm looking for, you know, good sources of quality fat. Again, like I mentioned uh, olive oil, avocado, uh, flax oil, fish oil. Uh, things like that, uh, nuts, like uh, walnuts, almonds, things like that. You can get a lot of good healthy fat in your diet, and it will help to, uh, I mean, it does play a big role. I mean, healthy fat is critical for optimal health, and it's critical for, you know, natural hormonal pr uh, production. It's critical for keeping your immune system high. I mean, there's a lot of benefit to having adequate uh, healthy fat intake. Uh, the problem is, is when we overdo it with processed, you know, low quality oils, like low quality vegetable oil and then things like that. Uh, let's move on. Let's see. Uh, Soham is joining us and he says, uh, I'm involved in a sport which requires both conditioning and strength. So what kind of program should I do? Well, obviously I think you would follow something that's going to build up your conditioning and your strength. <laughs> uh, when it comes to sport-specific training, the, the way I, I like to uh, structure it, like a lot of people come to me saying, okay, I'm playing you know, such and such a sport. How do I get better at that sport? Thinking that they're going to do something in the weight room that's going to directly correlate to that sport. And a lot of times there's not a direct correlation. What you do in the weight room is just gonna build up your general strength and power and you know, your, your overall conditioning athletic-wise but it's not necessarily going to correlate directly to a specific sport. You know, obviously you want to take your practice for whatever sport it is. You never even mentioned the specific sport here, so I'm just kind of being very vague in general. But if, if you're playing a sport, let's just say it's baseball. I mean, use your baseball practice for working on your specific skills, you know, your, your pitching, your batting, and, and things like that. I mean, your specific skills you want to work on the field, you know, work on those during your practices and during your games, etc. When you're in the gym, you're just focusing on building strength and power and your your athletic performance that way. I mean, trying to combine 
your, your, or to modify your gym workouts to sports specific doesn't always carry over. I mean, I know there may be certain movements that can kind of help, but focus on getting bigger and stronger and increasing your power in the gym and then leave your sports specific training to the field. And I think that will help, you know, correlate a lot more. Uh, the biggest thing when it comes to combining strength and strength training and sports training is your recovery, because obviously you can't give it a hundred percent to both. I mean, you, you can't be like doing sports practice six days a week and then in the gym weight training six days a week and expect to recover from it. You need to find that individual balance. And of course it's going to vary from person to person based on your work capacity. And it's also going to vary depending on, you know, the type of sport you're doing and the type of workout program you're following. But the biggest thing I, I'm going to caution you on is overtraining. And that is a very real problem for people who are doing sports as well as weight training. You need to find that ideal balance where you can still push yourself hard and have time to rest, recover, and grow in between those sports sessions as well as your weight training sessions. Okay. All right. Daniel's joining us and he's got a question here. He says he finds it hard to eat good. And in turn, my workouts have been up and down. Do I have any tips? Uh, the biggest tip that I can give you to simply improve your diet is to plan ahead. A, a lot of times people are very haphazard with their nutrition or they're not thinking far enough ahead. They're just thinking of you know, their next meal rather than actually structuring and planning their meals in advance. And that's one of the biggest distinctions you'll see when it comes to a bodybuilding diet and just you know eating whatever you want whenever you want is bodybuilders purposely think of their meals in advance and they'll have them planned out and they'll have the food available for when they need it rather than simply waiting until they're starving and saying oh I got to find something to eat and very often when you let yourself get hungry that's when you tend to make poor food choices so the best advice that I can give you is to plan your meals in advance and if you'd like some help with this, I actually have a free PDF report called Bodybuilding Nutrition Made Simple. And if you just head on over to my website at leehayward.com, uh, you'll see a link to it there in the side menu bar. Uh, just click on that and download the free report, and it'll be sent to your email address. But again, that covers the fundamentals of bodybuilding nutrition, and it also covers some meal prep tips that will help following a proper nutrition program easier. So again, if you want some help with that, I recommend downloading Bodybuilding Nutrition Made Simple. Okay, we've got the Red Devil 22 joining us. And he says, Lee, when I uh, front squats, I struggle to breathe in between reps. Any advice? Um, squatting in general uh, is one of those exercises where it is hard to breathe. You know, I mean, obviously, you're, it's a very demanding exercise, and front squats in particular, because uh, if you're doing them properly, you're going to have the barbell close to your neck, and it can kind of, you know, I'm not saying it's going to hinder you from breathing or whatever, but it, it's just you have all that weight, that strain on your body and everything else. It's going to make it difficult. So one of the things that I find helpful with, with heavy squats is, to do your breathing in between reps. So like you get yourself set up, take a couple deep breaths, hold your air in, do your squat, and then in between reps, take a couple deep breaths, you know, do your rep, and again, breathe in between reps. Another thing that's gonna help is to uh, limit the number of reps you're doing. So instead of trying to push yourself to failure, stop your sets short of failure. And think of the total volume of repetitions that you're doing. So for example, uh, if, if you wanted to do, yeah, I'm just going to pluck some numbers. Like, let's say you wanted to do 30 total reps. I mean, you could do three sets of 10, which would be very de demanding, especially with heavy weight. Or you could break it up and probably do like uh, five sets of six. You know, I mean, it's the same total volume of repetitions, but if you break it up and do more sets, then chances are the quality of the reps that you actually do will be better. And uh, you'll probably find it easier to breathe because you're not pushing yourself into the cardiovascular exhaustion zone that you do when you do high repetition squats. So, I mean, if, again, the, there's pros and cons to both. Obviously, there's there's advantages to high rep squatting and there's advantages to low rep squatting and, and everything in between. But that is a strategy that you might want to implement. If you're having trouble breathing and you find that, that is an issue, 
then break up your, your total volume of reps into more sets. So instead of pushing yourself to failure, uh, break it up so that you're doing the same volume over the course of the workout, but just broke down over more sets. And I think uh, you'll find that easier to complete. And again, you, the quality of the reps that you do will be better as well. All right, let's see what else we got here. Got Billy is joining us. He says, Lee, you're the reason I started training back in 2008. Well, thanks, Billy. Glad you've been uh, following along. That's uh, quite a while now, going on, you know, nine years of much appreciated. And uh, I'd say I wish you all the best with your workouts. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, Nippo Lippo is joining us. He says, Lee, do you have any tips on making the traps even? My non-dominant side is bigger. What's the deal with that? Uh, that's interesting. Um, when it comes to muscle development, I mean, generally speaking, your dominant side, meaning if you're right-handed, you're probably going to be bigger and stronger in your right side. And if you're left-handed, you'll probably be bigger and stronger in your left side. Uh, but it doesn't always correlate that way. Sometimes your non-dominant side can actually, you know, develop more so than your dominant side. And, you know, you know it, it's, there's numerous reasons why this could be. I mean, it could be like everything from muscle stimulation to just the way that your body fires nerve-wise. I mean, it could have different, you know, uh, muscle cells. You know, there, there's numerous reasons why we could have one side bigger than the other. But the only thing that you can actively do to try and balance it out, if you do have an imbalance between one side, is to focus on doing exercises where you're working each side independently. And generally speaking, that is dumbbell exercises, single limb exercises, or movements uh, where you're using machines that involve you know, each side independently, such as like the hammer strength machine with independent resistance. So when it comes to your traps, uh, you need to realize that the traps are more than just shrugging exercises. You know, I mean, obviously your shr shoulder shrugs, you know, are, are working your traps. But when you do a lot of back exercises, your traps are coming into play as secondary muscles. So what I would recommend if you have a big imbalance in your traps is to try and do all your shoulder work, all your back work uh, with single limb exercises or movements that allow independent resistance between the left and right sides. And if you would like some help with that, I actually posted up a video playlist not too long ago covering a full single limb uh, workout program. And if you, if you just head over to my main channel and look in the playlists, you'll see it, the single limb workouts, whatever it's called there. Uh, but just again, open up my playlist on my main channel page and uh, those single limb workout videos will give you some suggestions that you can use. I mean, there's a full single limb shoulder workout, single limb back workout, I mean, you can literally follow those workouts, but that will help to, uh, over time, balance out uh, your muscle development from the left and right sides. Now, you have to realize that it, you're probably never gonna be perfectly balanced, and I'll give you an example. Um, a lot of pro bodybuilders, I mean, you see people who are at the top of their game have muscle imbalances. I mean, Jay Cutler, prime example, he had he, one arm bigger than the other, one leg bigger than the other. And I mean, it was visible. You see him like do a front double bicep. You could visibly see one arm bigger than the other. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, same thing. You know, he had one arm bigger than the other. And you see this in a lot of pro bodybuilders. So if a pro bodybuilder who has good genetics is at the top of their game, I mean, their whole life is revolved around bodybuilding. I mean, they're willing to do whatever it takes to succeed in that sport. If they still have muscle imbalances, then the odds of average people like you and me having muscle imbalances is pretty high. And I mean, if, if someone like Jay Cutler and Arnold Schwarzenegger and those guys couldn't correct their imbalances, then, you know, then you're probably not going to correct it either. Now, I mean, I'm not saying improvement is impossible because you can always make some improvements to minimize the imbalance, but it's probably always going to be an imbalance there. I mean, you're probably going to have one side always a bit bigger or stronger and more dominant than the other. And then again, that's just the way it is. And it's not necessarily, you know, a bad thing. It's just you kind of have to learn to accept it and move on and, and kind of make the best of the situation and do the best with what you have. Uh, 
Okay, another question here. This one's from Animal Mother. Gotta love all these usernames. Uh, it says three by five on the bench and overhead press, three by ten on two additional exercises for chest and shoulders each, three by ten for one tricep isolation. Decent push day. I guess it is. I mean, <laughs> when it comes to your workouts, any, I mean, there's there's not one perfect program. I mean, any variation of sets and reps and exercises i mean you can mix it up and i mean as long as you're training in a progressive overload fashion and you're making progress over time i mean you can use those exercises and make you know great progress so yeah i mean it's a decent workout i mean the thing is is be consistent with it and train in a progressive overload fashion and once you hit a plateau with those exercises because whatever workout program you follow eventually you're going to hit a plateau in it that's just inevitable I mean, nobody can continue making progress forever. You're always going to hit a plateau at some point or another. Once you do, then that's your cue to change things up. Either change up the set and rep pattern, to change up the exercises, or change something within your workout program. And that's generally the best way to overcome a plateau and to can continue making progress over the long term. Right? The worst thing to do is to be stuck in a plateau and to continue trying to do the same thing over and over, kind of like beating your head against the wall. I mean, like, let's just say, you know, your, your overhead press is stuck and you've been several weeks now not making any progress in your overhead press. And the worst thing to do is to continue doing your overhead press just like you have been over and over again. I mean, the best thing to do in that situation would be to either change the exercise variation entirely. You know, maybe instead of doing a barbell press, you're going to do a dumbbell press or a machine press, uh, change up the set and rip pattern, you know, Change up something so that you're providing your body with unique muscle stimulation and allow you to make new progress in a different exercise. And, you know, then eventually you can probably go back to the original exercise that you were hit a plateau in and probably, you know, surpass that because once you come back to it after changing up your training routine, then, you know, you've given your body a break from it. And then it's, it's kind of like unique muscle stimulation all over again in that previous exercise. But again, if you're stuck in a plateau, don't keep banging your head against the wall and doing the same thing over and over again. Change it up. Okay. Here's a question from The Forced Miner, and he says, is strength training any good for building muscle? Yeah, I think it is. Uh, there's been a few people out there who have built some muscle from strength training. So, yes, it is good for building muscle. Uh, more people asking about Rich Piana's passing. I'm just going to move on from that. That's already been covered. Uh, ketogenic or carb cycling, which is more useful? Um, both have their place. I mean, they're, obviously, uh, a lot of ketogenic diets do incorporate some sort of carb cycling in there. I mean, most people don't stay on a, a ketogenic diet forever. They usually you know, have some sort of, of carb cycling rotation built in. Uh, but... It's not necessarily a matter of one is more useful. It's it really depends on the individual and their training situation and, and you know what they're training for. I mean, obviously, for for fat loss, I would be you know a low carb ketogenic diet can be beneficial. Um, uh, so, but I mean, if you're in a muscle building phase, sometimes a you know a carb cycling diet is more beneficial. So again, it, I'm not really going to say like one is better than the other. It really depends on the situation and you know. Um, depends on the individual the fitness goals, you know, their individual body type, everything else. There's, you know, that applies to a lot of things. I mean, it's not that one is better or worse. It really depends on the situation. Uh, Kevin's joining us and he says, I have a light cold. Can I train some arms today? <laughs> uh, even if you have a, a cold, sometimes you can still work out around it. And, Again, the, the key word here is you have a light cold. So maybe you got a bit of a sniffle or a runny nose. Uh, you know, you're not feeling 100%, but it doesn't mean that you have to take the day off entirely. Uh, I mean, sometimes moderate exercise can be one of the best things to, uh, you know, help you to get over a cold. And I purposely like to get out and do some, uh, you know, cardiovascular exercise low intensity cardio that is when i'm feeling under the weather especially if i can get outside if i'm breathing in fresh air outside that can help to just clear out the sinuses and it generally makes you feel better but if as long as you're not like coughing and snotting and, and making you know it's, it's not disgusting or anything like that 
you can still go to the gym and do a light workout. I mean, obviously, you wouldn't be pushing yourself to failure and trying to hit PRs, but you can still go and do a light workout. And very often, you'll feel better because of that rather than if you just sat around and did nothing. So I am a fan of, of doing light workouts uh, if you're feeling a bit just, again, a, a mild sickness, like maybe like a light cold, some runny nose or a bit stuffy or something like that. But if you're full on sick, like you've got the flu, you know, fever or chills and, and you I mean you're, you are literally under the weather big time then obviously you, you shouldn't be going to the gym and and risk spreading that to all the other members as well but if, if it's just a mild you know sniffle or something like that you can train but just of course adjust the intensity of your workout accordingly okay Uh, another question here. Any thoughts on the battle ropes? Are they good for the shoulders? Uh, battle ropes are, are an interesting exercise. We have a set of battle ropes at the gym that I train at, and I do use them occasionally. I, I kind of like them as a finishing move. I mean, I, I really, you know, sometimes if I'm finishing off like an arm workout, I might, you know, to do a few minutes of battle ropes, like usually do a few sets because the battle ropes are intense. I mean, if, if you get in there and like you like set a stopwatch or something for like 30 seconds of, of you know battle rope, uh, that can be quite an intense. And you do several different rounds of it. Uh, but you know, it, it's just another training tool. I mean, there's so many different tools that you have available. But the thing that I like about it is the time under tension and the I guess the volume and the intensity that you can build up through that. But uh, I like to use them as a finishing exercise, and it's really a total body movement. I mean, I know you're asking, are they good for the shoulders? But I mean, yes, they are. But it's not only the shoulders; it's basically your entire. Uh, it's a total body workout because you're obviously you're working your arms, you're working your chest, your back, your shoulders, uh, your core comes into play. I mean, everything is is active when you're doing something like the battle ropes, and uh, either do it as like do some low intensity battle rope as a warm up. Or if you want to really push it, save it for the end of, end of your workout as a finishing exercise. That's what I would recommend. Um, okay. Jane Abs 102 says, I've lost 85 pounds so far by counting calories and exercise. I have a lot of gym members encouraging me to eat more protein. Is, it, is too much protein bad for you? How much is too much? Well, first off, congratulations on losing 85 pounds. That is very impressive. And again, you deserve a, a virtual pat on the back for that. That's a huge accomplishment. Uh, as far as protein, you want to eat enough protein so that you are meeting your daily protein intake needs. But too much protein is too much. I mean, you don't need more than, you know, I guess what your body requires for re recovery and growth. A good rule of thumb that a lot of people can follow, especially if, if your goal is fat loss, is one gram of protein per pound of lean body weight per day. And I, I emphasize lean body weight. So if, if you know what your body fat percentage is, or even if you can just you know estimate it, then you can calculate out your lean body mass. And one gram of protein per pound of lean body mass is enough for you to meet your daily protein intake needs, have enough protein for muscle growth and repair and recovery, uh, and that will be fine because it'll help to keep your calories under control because you can eat too much protein. I mean, especially if, if you're in a fat loss diet. I mean, even though the calories you consume from protein are less likely to get stored as body fat compared to excess carbo carbohydrates or excess fat, it can still get converted into body fat. I mean, your body will take the protein and, that it doesn't need and it can convert it into glucose and that glucose can then be stored as excess body fat if you eat too much. Uh, so that's what I would recommend for people whose main goal is fat loss. If your main goal is building muscle, then I would recommend shooting for one gram of protein per pound of body weight. That will be, in this case, total body weight. That will be a good minimum. I mean, and obviously the reason why you're going to have a variance is because if your goal is building muscle, you want to be in a caloric surplus and consume more. If your goal is fat loss, you want to be in a caloric deficit and consume less. So that's what I would recommend for most people. Now, of course, you can get into specific dietary strategies. I'm not going to get into it here, but I mean, like, for example, if you're following like a, 
a low carb diet or a ketogenic diet or something like that, then obviously you, you know your protein intake will probably vary more so than someone who's eating a well balanced diet where they're eating a balance of all the three macronutrients. So I mean, you know that that can come into play as well. But for the majority of people, for fat loss, one gram of protein per pound of lean body weight per day. For mass building, shoot for a minimum of one gram of protein per pound of total body weight per day. And that should put you in the ballpark for the optimal range. And then, of course, you can experiment with that from there. I mean, if, if you're in a mass building phase and you want to experiment with eating more protein, hey, by all means, give it a try and see how it works for you. Uh, for fat loss, if you want to experiment with more or less, again, you know, try it out and see how it works for you. You know, the, the main thing is that you are consistent over the long term with your diet and exercise. I mean, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to be good enough that you're actually moving yourself in the right direction and you have to be consistent with it. That is the most important thing. Uh, you know, the, the whole uh, on and off again, you know, dieting on and off, working out on and off. I mean, on and off doesn't produce much results because whatever progress you make while you're on, you're going to backtrack and lose it when you're off. So, I mean, it's the consistency over the long term that's going to determine your results more than anything. Okay, Mustafa is joining us. And he says, I'm having trouble limiting my caloric intake. I always end up eating more. Please give me some tips. Uh, what I would recommend, and again, this is kind of just a you know, a, a general suggestion here, try eating fewer meals. And I, I mentioned this earlier in our video chat. If you've been following along the whole video chat, you've heard me mention this. When you sit down to a meal, you're going to eat until you're comfortably full, right? That implies whether you're in a mass building phase, you're in a fat loss phase, you are going to, your, your default is to eat until you're satisfied. That's, that's what you want to do. Your body is programmed through, through evolution to eat until it's satisfied. So if you want to limit your calories, limit the number of meals. Don't try and limit the calories per meal. And I think that will work more in your favor. And something along the lines of like an intermittent fasting type program can really help in this. And, um, you know, I, I recommend doing some homework on intermittent fasting if, you're, if you are struggling with controlling your appetite uh, because it's easier to go a prolonged period of time without eating and actually get your body into a fat burning mode than it is to eat frequent meals throughout the day but have small meals where you're actually leaving the table still hungry. Uh, when you get into an intermittent fasting mode and you bo your body actually adapts to it, it's easier to control your calories and it's easier to, to, to limit your food intake because uh, what, you, what I very often find is people who eat small frequent meals, every time you eat, you're spiking your appetite. And if, if you're not satisfying your appetite by, you know, eating until you're comfortably full, you're just, you know, eating a little tiny bit of food and then leaving the table hungry, then that just drives you nuts. <laughs> it's very hard to stick to a program like that because it's, it's frustrating. You know, you're eating a little bit, you're stimulating your appetite and you're stimulating all the metabolic processes in your body but you're never getting satisfaction. So I find that an intermittent fasting program where you're eating till you're satisfied, but you're just eating less frequently is much more beneficial and much more easier to stick with uh, in these situations. So I would recommend doing some homework on intermittent fasting. And there's a shit ton of YouTube videos out there. There's a lot of articles out there. Uh, I, I, you just go out there and do a search for intermittent fasting and you will find oodles of information to keep you busy. But that's what I would suggest for people who have trouble controlling their appetite. Uh, Jeffrey is joining us and he says, Lee, on uh, Bill Starr's 5x5 five five program, it says uh, the three rep set is 2.5% above uh, Monday's top set of five reps. Use the same weight from your third set for the final set of eight. Typing more info. Oh, okay. Um, okay, wait, I'm just trying to link up his comments here because, yeah, there, there's a gap between. So I just got five pounds for those sets and do that for the third. Um, tell you what, Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffrey's actually a member of the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Inner Circle, and that is one of the programs that we have in there. Uh, what I'm going to do, rather than... Uh, try and explain it here on the video chat. I'm going to uh, write you an email personally 
and explain how the progression for that workout goes. So I'm not going to leave you hanging on that one, but I, I'll literally, as soon as I finish up this video chat, I'll, I'll shoot you an email and uh, we'll go into the details about how the, the weight progression works for the 5x5 program. Okay. What's a good program for fighters to gain power and speed? This one is from uh, Moses Escobar. Um, I kind of mentioned this in one of the previous questions. Someone was talking about combining sports and weight training together. Uh, and I mentioned how your sports-specific skills can't necessarily be duplicated in the gym, in the weight training gym, that is. So, uh, obviously, if, if you're a fighter, then your fighting skills, you know, your speed, your, your you know, the, the, all your technical skills that you're going to need for fighting, be it MMA fighting or boxing or, or whatever it is, then you're going to do that in your actual practice sessions and in your, your fights and stuff like that when you're sparring, when you're doing the bag work, when you're doing, you know, focus mitt work or, or whatever it is you're doing. You're going to focus on the actual technical skills there. In the weight room, that's where you're just going to work on building general strength and conditioning. And, and it's not necessarily, you know, you're going to do a weight training workout that's going to be a fighter's weight training workout. I mean, a lot of times you can follow like a, a powerlifting style training program or even a bodybuilding style training program and have that strength carry over into your practice as long as you apply it in your actual sessions when you're practicing your fighting skills. So like I wouldn't recommend like grabbing dumbbells and start trying to throw punches with dumbbells or, or some stupid stuff like that. I mean, save the gym session, that is the weight training gym session for building muscle and increasing your strength. And then in you know your, your practice sessions where you're doing your, your fighting practice, work on your technical skills and your speed and all that stuff there. Don't try and combine the two of them together uh, because a lot of times it just, you know, obviously it can increase your risk of injury, but there's not a direct carryover. So that's what I would recommend. You know, it's just a, a good basic bodybuilding or powerlifting style program for your strength training. And then, uh, you know, save your fighting skills for, for there. Again, another thing that I'm going to emphasize, and I kind of I mentioned it before in the video chat, when you're combining sports like this, fighting, bodybuilding, or anything like that, you need to make sure that you're getting adequate rest and recovery because that is going to be the biggest thing. If, if you get yourself overtrained where you're doing too much, you know, practice in, in, the, in the ring and then you're also doing too many, you know, too much weight training and then too much cardio conditioning and all that, you're just going to burn yourself out. You're like burning the candle at both ends. So you need to factor in adequate rest recovery into your program. And I think that will have a big impact. I mean, sometimes even if you're limiting, uh, you know, your, your weight training workouts or you're limiting some of your cardio workouts in order to get more rest and recovery in there, uh, that can sometimes actually be advantageous rather than trying to, you know, push yourself to do too much in, in a given week and just burning yourself out. Uh, Mark's joining us. He says, uh, my left shoulder uh, and elbows are sore, but fighting through it, I've tried my grips using dumbbells, etc. Could it be my age? I'm 51. I don't want to lose my gains. All right. When it comes to shoulder problems, I mean, I a lot of people, if, if you are around the iron game long enough, you're probably going to experience shoulder problems. The shoulders are very vulnerable to injury and, and not even injury, just like nagging aches and pains. And one of the things you want to focus on with your shoulders is to make sure that you keep them in balance. A lot of people have the tendency to overwork the front and side delts and underwork the rear delts. So make sure to excuse me, make sure to include adequate rear delt training in your workouts to keep things in balance and proportion. Uh, another thing that I would recommend is doing some shoulder mobility exercises before every workout, not just a shoulder workout, but before every single workout. And the reason for that is the shoulders come into play as, you know, secondary or supporting muscles in virtually every single training session. I mean, if you're training chest, you're also working your shoulders. If you're training arms, you're also indirectly working shoulders. Uh, you know, your, your back exercises, your shoulders are going to come into play. Even legs. I mean, a lot of people don't think of it, but if you're doing leg workouts, like for example, if you're doing squats and you have a barbell across your shoulders, I mean, look at that awkward position that the barbell is placing. I mean, it's placing a lot of strain on the shoulder joint. 
So you need to do some shoulder mobility warm-ups before training legs. So make sure to do some shoulder mobility work um, every single training session. And it doesn't have to take long. I mean, literally, you know, five minutes tops. That's all it takes. But it's just something to limber up the shoulders, get the blood flowing, and to increase mobility there so that you're not... You know, placing strain on your shoulders while they're they're cold and not warmed up. Uh, obviously, your age is going to play a role. I mean, the older you get, generally the more aches and pains you you get in the body. But if you look after yourself and and train smart, you can still you know continue to work out and continue to be mobile and active well into your 50s, 60s, 70s, and beyond. So I mean, I, I wouldn't use that as a limiting factor. But again, just you know. Be calm, have some common sense about it. I mean, if you're 50 years old, you're not going to have the same, uh, you know, agility as you did when you were in your 20s. So, I mean, just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. But don't use it as a limiting factor, saying, oh, you know, I'm, I'm too old or anything like that. I mean, you can always make progress regardless of what age you're at, you know, but just, you know, be smart about it. Uh, if you want some help with this, I have a video. If you go to just do search for Lee Hayward Rotator Cuff, uh, it's on YouTube. It's a, one of my more popular videos. But it's, it's an older one, but it's a good one. And it covers uh, a lot of information about shoulder training, and it covers some specific shoulder exercises and mobility exercises that you can use. Now, I mean, obviously in that video, I'm focusing a lot on rotator cuff issues, but the same exercises and the same strategies can apply to any type of shoulder injury or pain that you're dealing with. So again, just do a YouTube search for Lee Hayward rotator cuff, and you should find that video. Okay, Ali M is joining us and says, Lee, I stopped working out for a year, for half a year. How should I restart? You should restart just like a beginner. So regardless of how advanced you were before you quit working out, you need to resume just the same as a beginner would. Now, the good thing is it's easier to regain lost muscle than it is to gain it in the first place. So, I mean, if you know, the first time you go about building your, your body, it's, it takes a long time to build up to a level of strength, a level of development. Uh, regaining lost muscle is a lot quicker. So that's a, a plus. But you still have to go about it just like a beginner. So I would recommend starting back with a basic total body workout three days a week. Uh, you know, just, just ease yourself into it. Uh, the, the biggest problem that beginners have is they try and do too much too soon and end up burning themselves out or getting injured or overtraining in the process. I mean, it's very easy for a beginner to overtrain because their body is deconditioned. And if you haven't been working out for half a year, well, your body is deconditioned as well. So start off slow and, and just pace yourself with a, a very simple program. Uh, if, if you go to my main YouTube channel, there's one right there on the main page. It's a total body beginner's workout program. Uh, it's a three day per week program. I'd recommend you follow that. Uh, on your off days from weight training, you could do some low intensity cardio, like, you know, just getting outside and going for a walk. I mean, it doesn't have to be anything earth shattering or, or, or complex. Just get yourself in the habit of exercising on a regular basis. So total body weight training workout one day, go for a walk the next day. Total body weight training workout one day, go for a walk the next day. And just do that for the next six weeks to build up your fitness level and your work capacity. And then after that, you can gradually get into some more advanced exercises and some more high intensity cardio and things like that. But, you know, start off slow and just keep it simple. You know, for your first month or so back, just go through the motions and let your body build up its work capacity gradually. Don't try and force anything. Just be consistent. That's all that matters. And then as you start to make progress, you know, you can gradually modify your workouts and that to accommodate your, your fitness level and to make it more challenging. But again, when you're starting off, just keep it simple. All right, let's see what else we got. Uh, I found out I have an endomorph body type. How would that benefit in nature without modern technology? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> moving on. Shit, I, I, I just lost my place there. I, I scrolled. I, there's so many comments and questions coming through. I, I can scroll through and miss a ton of them. Um, all right, let's see what else we got. Uh, 
Uh, someone's asking, do I still remain in contact with Elliot Hulse? I haven't spoke to Elliot in quite some time. So, uh, no, I guess I haven't. I mean, I, I still see the stuff he posts online and stuff like that. But, no, I haven't been to Florida myself in several years. Uh, when was it? I think it was 2012 was the last time I was down in Florida. So, no, I haven't been in contact with Elliot for quite a while. Uh, Ivan's joining us and he's saying, Lee, I'm getting pins and needles in my arms while I sleep. How can I stop this? Well, it really depends on what's causing it, but if it's in your hand specifically, it sounds like it could be carpal tunnel syndrome. And that's something that is very common. You get this kind of numbness, pins and needles sensation, uh, usually in your hands. Uh, you're saying you're getting it in your arms. So, I mean, it could be some other form of nerve impingement or something like that um, something like this I would recommend uh, getting it checked out by your doctor or a, a physiotherapist or someone who can diagnose your situation uh, in person because there's a lot of things that could be going on here and, and it's hard for me to just you know from a, a simple YouTube comment to kind of diagnose what's going on here but uh, a lot of times it could be nerve impingements in your neck, in your shoulders, uh, that could be causing pain to shoot right down through your arms all the way to your hands. Uh, I actually made a video a while back where I was experiencing unexplained finger pain in my index finger. And I, I made a video about it because what it was, uh, I actually had a nerve impingement in my neck that was causing indirect pain in my hands. And I had no other symptom but... My index finger was just causing me this sharp shooting pain, and it was very weak. I had no strength in my index finger whatsoever, and I went to the doctor to get it checked out, and of course, through his examination, he found out that I did have a nerve impingement in my neck, and then he recommended some uh, you know, exercises and things like that that I could do to help uh, alleviate that pain in the neck and to release the tension in the nerves, which then released all that tension running down through the arms and all the way down to the hands. Uh, if, if you want to, to see that video that I made about that, uh, just do a search for Lee Hayward uh, finger pain. <laughs> Literally, just go to YouTube, type that in, Lee Hayward finger pain, and you should see that video. And again, I, I go into detail about how the, the nerve impingement that I had in my neck was causing all those issues. And again, I went in, I'm going to cover some of the exercises that I did to help relieve it. But um, I would recommend getting this checked out by your doctor so that you can find out what exactly it is that's causing this. I mean, it, it very well may be a nerve impingement, but like I say, I don't know for sure. So it's something that you really need to check out. Okay, let's see what else we got here. I'm just giving through. A lot of people talking about Rich Piano. I'm not going to go into any more about that. <laughs> um, George says, or sorry, Jorge, it might be. <laughs> I, I made that mistake one time before. I was down in, uh, I was actually on vacation down in Mexico a few years back, and, and the bartender had his name tag, right? And it was Jorge. And, and I called him George because I'm, I'm, you know, my English speaking tongue. I mean, I see, you know, J O R G, is it George, right? So, sorry, I called you George, but I think your name is Jorge. <laughs> uh, his question is, I only do compound exercises for chest. Is that all right? I mean, if you're just starting out, yeah, that's all right. I mean, you only need to keep it basic and simple if you're just starting out. But as you get more uh, advanced with your workouts, there's advantages to doing both compound and isolation moves. And one of my favorite styles of training for complete overall muscular development is positions of flexion. And this is a style of training that utilizes mid-range compound exercises, fully stretched isolation, and fully stretched, um, or sorry, and peak contraction isolation. So mid-range stretch and uh, peak contraction. And you need a combination of both compound mass building moves as well as isolation moves in order to get this. So, um, I mean, if, if, again, if you're just starting out and you're getting into a, a workout routine it's okay to just stick to the compound stick to the basics but as you get more advanced you'll find that uh, isolation exercises are a very valuable addition and they can help to take your muscular development to a higher level once you're at that stage so 
I mean, obviously, if you're asking this question now, I'm going to assume that you're probably in that beginner or intermediate phase. So it's, it's okay to keep to the, the, the basics and just do compounds for now. But as you become more advanced and you need to expand your, your workout routine, uh, you can add in some isolation exercises. And uh, that can be really good for targeting the specific body parts that you want to work uh, without you know, bringing in all the other secondary and supplementary uh, body parts as well. Uh, Phillips joining us says, hi Lee, nice channel, thank you for your work, glad you appreciate it, Philip. Uh, kiss. Okay, I got a question here from King, and he's saying, can you please list supplements that you would use for fat loss and bulking, and can we use them simultaneously? All right. When it comes to supplements, I have a, a, I guess, a unique opinion on supplements. The longer I've been around the whole bodybuilding and fitness industry, the less I use supplements and the more I focus on solid food. Now, I'm not saying that supplements are useless because there are some that are definitely helpful, but um, for the most part, they're not nearly as beneficial as the, the I guess, the fitness media would like you to believe um, you know obviously there are fat burning supplements out there it's supposedly going to help to increase your metabolism curb your appetite and stuff like that and then there are weight gainer type supplements that can help you to bump up your caloric intake and stuff like that uh, one thing if, if your goal is fat loss focus on fat loss if your goal is mass building then focus on mass building don't try and do both at the same time uh, if you try and do both at the same time, you're kind of going to get mixed results in both. You're not really going to get as lean as you want. You're not really going to get it as, as you know big and strong as you want. You're going to you know, focus on one thing at a time. So obviously, if, if you're trying to lose fat, then don't take a fat burner and a mass builder at the same time. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's kind of contradictory. Um, as far as supplements are concerned, like if you want like the, the basics of, of some supplements that you can use, um, I think I actually put together a video that goes into detail covering, you know, the, the, the top five supplements that I recommend. If you just do a search for like Lee Hayward, top five supplements, uh, you'll see the top five recommended supplements. But I'm going to suggest right now, um, when it comes to fat loss or mass building, focus on your diet and your training first. Seriously, you don't even need to worry about supplements at the you know when you're starting off. I mean, some of them can help in terms of like a crutch. Like sometimes if you want to take a fat burner to help you know control your appetite or to boost your energy a little bit, that can help. But it's not nearly as big of an impact on your results as you would think. I mean, it's the main thing is your overall diet and the same thing when it comes to mass building i mean you, yeah you can take some like protein supplements or a weight gainer supplement to help bump up your caloric intake especially if you find it hard to consume a lot of solid food but other than that it's, it's, they're not really going to do a whole lot now you can get into some specific supplements like things like creatine and i mean that can help to uh, increase your muscle fullness and give you some more strength and energy uh, something like that can be used regardless if you're bulking or cutting because it is, it, it's basically a non-calorie supplement. It's just going to help to increase your muscle strength and fullness. And I mean, that can help while you're in a mass building phase, obviously, but it can also help you to maintain your lean mass while you're losing body fat. So something like creatine can be used either bulking or cutting. Uh, just your basic, you know, vitamin and minerals, they can be used either bulking or cutting. There's really no differentiating there. Uh, one supplement that a lot of people don't uh, use but can be very beneficial is uh, greens powder. I mean, this can help to, I mean, just like you would take a protein powder to supplement your protein intake, you take a greens powder to supplement your vegetable intake. And a lot of people are not getting enough fruit and vegetable in their diet. Uh, so that's one thing that I'm a big fan of. I, I personally take greens powder every single day. Um, I actually don't mix it up as a drink. Like in most green supplements, I mean, they're bought and meant to be, you know, mixed with water or mixed with juice or something like that, or mixed in a smoothie, something. Uh, I, I literally just take the powder, put it in my mouth, and chase it down with water. I mean, I find that that is the most convenient way to take it. And by doing so, it doesn't ruin anything else. Like sometimes if I mix it with water, it kind of like 
you know, it doesn't taste the best or, or if I mix it with a protein shake, it kind of ruins the protein shake. So, you know, so I'm not ruining anything. I'm just kind of getting the most efficient way possible. I just literally take the powder, put it in the greens powder, that is, because it's, it's only a small scoop. And I, I put that in my mouth and just chase it down with water. And I find that that's the easiest way to take it. I'm almost like taking it like a vitamin pill for that matter. Uh, but that's one thing I would recommend, regardless of your bulking or cutting. Uh, what's some other ones? Digestive enzymes. If you are following a mass building program, this can be very important because obviously when you're consuming a lot of calories, it's placing a lot of workload on your digestive system. So digestive enzymes, probiotics, uh, they can be of great assistance when you're following a high calorie mass building program because it can help your body to digest and utilize all that extra food that you're consuming. So that's uh, another one that I would recommend. Uh, what else? If, I mean, obviously, you know, protein powders, if you're having trouble meeting your protein intake needs for solid food, uh, then you can supplement your diet with protein. Uh, that tends to be more of a asset when you're in a high calorie bulking phase versus a fat loss phase. Now, if you're training for fat loss, I actually find it sometimes more advantageous to stick to solid food protein rather than protein supplements. And the reason for that is because you get more eating satisfaction from solid food. I mean, you drink a shake and it, it doesn't satisfy your hunger. I mean, yeah, you're, you're getting a bit of volume in your stomach, but it doesn't give you that long lasting eating satisfaction that you would get if you were eating solid food protein. For example, I mean, if, if you eat a chicken breast, that gives you a lot more eating satisfaction than simply, you know, drinking a protein shake. So if your goal is fat loss and controlling your calories, you're better off to actually consume the majority of your uh, nutrients, protein, carbs, and fat through solid food sources rather than supplementing them with, with powders and shakes. Uh, what else? I don't know. I think that's kind of just a kind of a general overview. Uh, if you would like some more help with this, uh, again, I would recommend checking out my uh, program bodybuilding nutrition made simple because it goes into detail in a lot of this stuff and covers the fundamentals of a proper muscle building and fat burning nutrition program and it actually covers some suggestions for for both how you would manipulate your diet to optimize fat loss or how you would manipulate it to optimize muscle building so again bodybuilding nutrition made simple it's a free pdf report and you can download it right on my website at leehayward.com all right, let's see what else. I'm going to take a few more questions and clue it up. I mean, we've been going for a bit over an hour now, so I usually like to limit these video chats to around an hour. Okay, a lot of some of these questions are uh, repeat questions. I guess people are just impatient and posting the same question multiple times. There's, All right, uh, question here. This one's an interesting one. This one's from Wolf, and he's saying, uh, can you gain muscle with just calisthenics? And yes, you can build muscle with body weight exercises alone. Uh, prime example of this, I mean, if you look at a physique of like a, a, a gymnast, I think a male gymnast, I mean, most of these guys are very lean and muscular and very well built, and they're primarily doing body weight exercises. So yes, you can build a lot of muscle with calisthenics. Uh, another prime example, if you go in like YouTube video, street workouts, and you see guys who are doing workouts like in, in playgrounds and parks, doing a lot of pull-ups and you know push-ups and dips and, and various different body weight exercises. So, I mean, yeah, you can gain a lot of muscle and build a very impressive physique with calisthenics alone. Uh, the only drawback to calisthenics or body weight exercises is you're limited to just your body weight. So in some cases, your body weight may not be enough resistance. In other cases, it may be too much resistance. And that's where weight training exercises or resistance machines can come into play because you can adjust the resistance according to your strength level. Uh, I find like for a lot of beginners, uh, body weight exercises are very often too intense. You know, you, you kind of go through this range where Okay, at the beginning, body weight exercises are too intense, like push-ups and pull-ups and dips. I mean, a lot of beginners don't have the strength to lift their entire body weight. Then as you build up to a certain level of development, then obviously your body weight becomes that ideal sweet spot where, you know, doing pull-ups with your body weight or dips with your body weight is kind of the ideal resistance. 
And then you can get to the point where you become more advanced and now all of a sudden your body weight isn't enough. I mean, yeah, you can just perform more sets and reps, but if you want to really tax yourself with some high intensity strength training, uh, sometimes your body weight is not enough. And then you get people having to either perform resistance exercises or adding weight to their body in terms of like adding like a weighted vest or a weight belt or something where you're actually increasing the weight so that you're doing your body weight exercises plus extra resistance. So, I mean, obviously, yeah, there, there is advantages to both, you know, body weight moves and uh, resistance exercises, weight training, free weights, machines, et cetera. But I, I personally, I think that the best approach is to use a combination of these exercises, you know, rather than thinking of just either or, think of and. So you're using, you know, uh, resistance exercises and body weight exercises to kind of get the best of both worlds. Okay. Hey, we got Joy is joining us. Joy Joy Monkey eighty nine says uh, says this is one of the oldest and best YouTube fitness channels. Thank you for your years of guidance, Lee. All right, appreciate that. Thanks for following along me, and I do appreciate the comments. Uh, another question here. This one's from Resper Respergu. Uh, says, "Is it safe to drink coffee before a workout?" Yes, you can have coffee before a workout. I mean, I, I, coffee is kind of like the original pre-workout. Uh, before you know all all the pre-packaged pre-workouts that you have available today, a lot of bodybuilders just used to have a cup of coffee before their workout. And the whole idea is just to get a, a little bit of a caffeine kick before you hit the gym. Uh, I mean, so you can kind of get the same benefits of a pre-workout from just plain old coffee. And the benefits, obviously, it, it's a source of caffeine. I mean, caffeine is a performance enhancing. I mean, it helps to uh, increase your mental focus, focus and alertness. It helps to increase your strength and energy. And it also helps to curb your appetite. So it can help you to get through a workout feeling strong, energetic, and not feeling hungry. So it's, it's a great pre-workout. I mean, you can use coffee, you can have a caffeine pill, or you could even just go ahead and, and you know, use some of the, the pre-workout formulas that are on the market. But most pre-workouts, the main ingredient in them is caffeine, which is what you're getting through plain old coffee. Personally, I like to have coffee. I mean, I enjoy coffee. I'm a coffee drinker. Either it's, you know, uh, just a cup of black coffee, uh, you know, a shot of espresso or something like that. Either one, I'm, I'm cool. Uh, but uh, that's my pre-workout of choice is literally just to have a cup of coffee before I train. And I find that it's it's enough caffeine and enough, I guess, of a energy boost to help me have a good workout without making me feel jittery or, or too much because that's one of the drawbacks with a lot of the pre-workout supplements out there is some of them are like overkill like they too much caffeine too much stimulants and everything else and it can end up giving you the jitters or can hinder your sleep or stuff like that and i find a lot of them are overkill and that's why i kind of like to take the moderate approach and just have a cup of coffee before i train <sighs> Okay. Okay. A lot of again, a lot of questions here, just repetitive questions. So I'm just kind of skimming through here. All right. Here's an interesting one. This one, um, Lee. How many cardio sessions should I be doing weekly, along with weight training, if I am skinny fat? All right. What I would recommend in that situation. I mean, skinny fat is, is kind of the, not the spot you want to be at, right? I mean, obviously you want to build mass, you want to, you know, build muscle throughout your body, but you also have some excess body fat that you'd like to lose. The main thing that I would recommend for someone who is in that skinny fat category is don't get hung up on, you know, your, your body weight and, and stuff like that. Focus on your athletic performance. That's why I, that's what I would recommend. Focus on getting stronger in the gym. Focus on improving your work capacity, improving your endurance with your cardio, and just focus on the athletic performance. Um, kind of 
temporarily ignore your body and just focus on the, the performance side of things. And what you'll find is as a side effect of improving your athletic performance, getting stronger, improving your work capacity, improving your endurance and everything else, then you will build muscle and burn fat from that alone. Uh, as far as your training sessions are concerned, uh, a great plan that you could follow is to do strength training one day, cardio the next. Strength training one day, cardio the next. And literally alternate them day for day like that. And what you'll find is while you're doing your cardio sessions in between your, your weight training, well, that's going to give your joints, tendons, and ligaments a break from the rigors of weight training. So it's kind of like an active recovery in between workouts. And it'll help to keep your metabolism elevated. It'll help to burn some body fat during those cardio sessions. And it's just a really good way to combine both weight training and cardio together in the same workout routine. So that's what I would recommend day for day. So weight training one day, cardio the next, and just alternate them back and forth. Now, of course, if you want to have a, a day off throughout the week, I mean, there, there's nothing wrong with that. So like say three weight training sessions, three cardio sessions, and then have one day of rest. I mean, that's, that's totally fine. But that's what I would recommend uh, if, if you're in that skinny fat category where you want to simultaneously build muscle while burning body fat. All right, guys, there's still a ton of questions coming through here, but I'm going to get ready and clue them off. Like I said, we've been at this for, for about an hour and 20 minutes or so now, so I'm going to clue it up. Uh, thanks again for tuning in. Uh, obviously, I appreciate your, your questions and support. I mean, obviously, without you guys tuning in, there would not be a video chat and so it is much appreciated, and I do, uh, you know, thank you for all your support. So what I'm going to do now is clue up this video chat. Obviously, once I clue it up, the replay will be posted up on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel. So if you're just joining, like, the, the later half of the video chat and you missed some of the early stuff, uh, then you can watch the replay if you want to uh, get the full video chat. So again, uh, have yourself a fantastic weekend, and I look forward to doing another one of these video chats with you next week. Take care. Over and out.